Welcome back to more personal training talk. This is the series where Nick and I have laid back honest conversations about fitness, health, mental health, and way more. In this episode, we are trying out something new. We are bringing you guys fitness and nutrition myth busters. In this video, we're going to introduce a lot of different theories and ideas. We'll give our opinions on it. And then from there, we will label it either a myth, a truth, or somewhere in between. I enjoyed bringing this to you guys today because we brought a lot of different topics crammed in one video. So we didn't spend too much time on each one. So hopefully this can offer a lot of different valuable information to you all. And now, thanks to Nick, we'll have timestamps in the comments below. So if you guys do want to jump to any individual topics, hit that comment section below and look for Nick's comments. And then you can go to anywhere you'd like. As you all can see, Nick is rocking the Birds jersey for the Eagles game. We recorded this the day of the Eagles game. And then that night, the Eagles proceeded to get the win. Go Birds! With no more further ado... Enjoy the show. Cool. Welcome back, everyone. As you can tell, the Eagles are playing today, so we're very excited. Go Birds. <laughs> so for today's episode, we're bringing you guys something new. We're bringing a new mini-series called Mythbusters. So in this series, our goal is to squash misconceptions, um, identify some truths in fitness and nutrition, but then along with that, I feel like there's going to be a lot of things in between, which I'm really excited to talk about. Maybe okay. some things aren't necessarily a myth, or a truth, but the answer lies somewhere in between. Yeah, it'll be nice to, you know, for us, certain things might seem like a simple answer, but to other people who aren't in the industry, it's, you know, it might not be as simple. So sometimes we have to take a step back and realize, okay, not everybody has the mentality we have. They don't do this every day for a yeah. living. So that's such a good point. Super common one. Imagine a client is trying to lose weight. This client is in a caloric deficit. They're doing everything that they should be doing. In theory, they are definitely going to lose weight. Would you say that's a myth or a truth? So just because a client is in a caloric deficit does not mean that they're going to lose weight all the time. So an example of that is say a client's supposed to be having 1600 calories a day. If they're eating 600 calories a day, they are at way too much of a deficit. So in doing that, their metabolism is going to be all over the place. Yeah. So that's really going to help them not help them, but it's going to make them struggle to lose weight because if your metabolism is not regulated, then you're not going to lose weight in an efficient way. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's such a good point where it's it's really easy to read like a statement that says you lose weight by burning more calories than you take in. So people take that to the extreme, really cut back on their calories, but it may be for a day or two, you may lose weight very temporarily, but then your body will do what it does. It will adapt, realize you're not getting much food, and then, like you said, affect your metabolism, and it's not really worth it at that point. Right, because everyone, well, everyone has a different metabolic panel. Like they, they, everyone's going to have different caloric needs. So you cannot always go off of, oh, so and so is eating X amount of calories. That's where I'm going to be as well. Like you can't do that. Everyone's going to be different. So mm -hmm. you have to figure out. We've spoken about this before in, in previous episodes. Is knowing what your uh, basal metabolic rate is. I said metabolic panel earlier, bas basal metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. um, knowing what that is, and then if you are looking for weight loss, okay, maybe decreasing your calories a little bit, but you cannot do hundreds and hundreds of calories. Granted, if you are overeating, say you're supposed to be having the 2,000, but you're yes. having 4,000 a day, okay, that's where you're going to be taking a lot more off the plate. Yes. But like I said, if you're right around the 2,000, okay, if you want to lose a couple pounds, let's drop it down to about 1,800. Because yes. over a week, that's 1,400 calories right there. So get, and that's roughly what? G getting close to about half a pound a week because 3,500 calories is one pound. So that's the thing with, a lot of times on my fitness pal, 3,500 calories is a pound. So they'll say, oh, eat this amount. You know, that's a pound per week, which can be dangerous over time because people don't have that many calories to give off. Yeah. And I feel like just something I've seen in my career, at least, like, I feel like the human body is anything but linear with progress. Like, in theory, that makes sense that someone should be losing, you know, if they're following this calorie restriction, they should be losing weight at a certain amount of like a certain pace. But I feel like more people than not don't lose at a certain pace. And maybe it's two weeks of no weight loss, but then two weeks of really a lot of progress. Like, and I think that's where it gets hard, where it's not just this like 
formula that you're putting into a calculator, you execute it and the outcome is super concrete. It's something that's like very different for a lot of people. There are some people who could get a really accurate reading of their BMR, do a slight deficit, slightly less than that, and still maybe not get the results that they want. And at that point, maybe there's other factors to identify. It's probably like, there's nothing wrong with you at that point. Maybe there's something wrong with the way your body's digesting or processing foods, or like you said, your metabolism. Another huge factor is sleep. Maybe you're not recovering well at all. So even whatever you're eating isn't getting you know, like used well. So to conclude, that is neither a myth or a truth. That is somewhere in between. Right. Cool. So moving on to our next topic. The next topic is does a pound of muscle weigh more than a pound of fat? Or just does muscle weigh more than fat? Yeah. I, um, I love this question. I feel like I want to let you take the floor on this one, but I want to just share a story before that. Um, I remember growing up when I was very first going, getting into going mm -hmm. to the gym, um, I was a member at the local LA Fitness. And I think the trainer there might have noticed that I was just like interested in the gym. So he pulled me over for like one of those free assessments and basically like got me sucked in the really excited about working out and then showed me the price and tried to get me to convince my dad to sign up for training. It was kind of like a grimy trainer. But uh, I remember one of his big things was getting out. And some of you guys may have seen this before. They get out like a ball of muscle and then a ball of fat. And the trainers will tell you that muscle weighs more than fat. So even if your weight doesn't change, that likely means you're putting on muscle. I think at the time, especially at my age, I thought that made a lot of sense. And I didn't think too much into it. But I feel like now doing what we do and just being more experienced in this industry, we definitely know the validity of that statement if there is any. So I'll let you talk about that. Well, I mean, figure if you have, when I kind of said it in the question or when I was introducing it, a pound is a pound. It's like that common uh, the joke or uh, the, the brain teaser, you know, what weighs more, a pound of bricks or a pound of feathers? Or a, a ton of bricks, a ton of feathers. It's, they're both a ton. Like, obviously, a brick, if you have one brick, it's going to weigh more than a feather. But if you have the same exact weight, it's the same thing. What are the odds that, like, if you lost a pound of fat, that your body would exactly happen to put on a pound of muscle at the same time to offset it? Like, that wouldn't happen. That's right, what but, I feel like that theory is saying. Like, right. But it, it, so to combat that, it's that's where body fat comes in when you, when you get a body fat percentage because that's showing that okay your body fat percentage is going down but not like oh you lost x amount of pounds of just fat yes so like there there could be a little bit of mix in between which is fine but as long as that body fat percentage is coming down that's the ideal goal long yes. term i love that you said that because i feel like that is especially if you have the technology available that's the best way to track progress is body fat percentage opposed to weight right so that's awesome absolutely yeah so I think it's safe to say that that one was a myth. <laughs> Next topic. So let's say we get a new client. New client comes in and we treat them just how we treat most new clients. We introduce them to a plan. We talk about strength training. And that client says, hold up, Nick. I don't want to do strength training. I am not trying to get too bulky and I don't want my arms to be too big. Yeah. What would you say to someone like that? Do you think that's a myth? Do you think that's a truth? Or do you think that's somewhere in between? I think it's 100% a myth. And I will, I, what I recently have done is that if in the first package that a client purchases, I tell them if they feel that they are too bulky within the first package, which takes five, six weeks, that it's free. That if they're too bulky in the five or six weeks and it's, you know, I'll give them their money back. Cause it's not, it doesn't, it does not happen that way. It takes years and years of consistency to be deemed bulky, but everyone, everyone's gonna be different. Everyone, everyone's gonna have a different perspective of what bulky is. But I feel like that there is a massive misconception and I don't mean to categorize anyone, but I feel like mainly female clients have this mentality, which, you know, it, uh, this has to be debunked immediately because you're, you, one, immediately you're not going to be bulky at, at all. And mm -hmm. if anything, it is so empowering for a female to be able to strength train because I feel like a lot of women that go to the gym, they go near the dumbbell area and they're like, listen, that's uncharted territory, not going there. Yep. And you know, it's very good when I have my female clients and they're like, oh, I went to so-and-so gym, did, and they show me the routine and it's 90% in the dumbbell area. I'm like, Yeah, Bravo. that's awesome, absolutely. Bravo, yeah. I love, I, I hate to generalize too, but I do feel like you're right that it is a lot of times women, and this is something I say to my clients all the time where, Oftentimes, again, I'm generalizing here, but a lot of yoga studios, you go to a yoga studio and oftentimes you'll see all kinds of people, but you'll generally see a lot of women. And oftentimes you'll see very flexible women with not a whole lot of muscle mass, right? Now let's think of the gym. 
going to a gym, you'll oftentimes see large men in the weight area working on those weights, building muscle, right? Usually they don't have the best mobility. In all reality, those people from yoga would get the most benefit by going to the gym and strength training. And then those people who are spending so much time strength training would get the most benefit by incorporating some mobility. Right. It's like you should work on the things that you aren't good towards. Right. And it, it also comes down to what do you deem as bulky? Like, like what is your... Perception of per bulky. Correct. And, you it's know... It's a great point. Some, yeah. You could look at someone and call them bulky and someone else could see that same person and not see anywhere close to bulky. It's your own perception of it. Right. And and it's not to dive too far into this world, but it's whoever you look at that you see as too bulky, are they on some sort of enhancement drug? If they are, then that's probably why they look bulky because their body is doing something that it doesn't naturally do. So that's where if you're seeing someone that you deem as bulky, yep. it's... No, you're abs absolutely a great point. You don't know everything that that person's doing right. behind the scenes. Absolutely. Right. And it, it all comes down to what's your goal. If your goal is just to be healthy and like you don't have to be obsessive about it. Right. All in all, saying that that topic is without a doubt a myth. Yep, absolutely. All right, so another one. Again, well, a theoretical client. Client asks you, Nick, is the absolute best and quickest way to lose fat by doing intense cardio training all the time? Going into answering that, what I immediately will say, to, because I've had clients ask me this before and I will have the same answer. You will lose weight. If you tie yourself to a treadmill, you will lose weight. But that doesn't mean that you're just losing fat. You're probably losing muscle mass, yeah. which is not the goal whatsoever. If, you, if, you, if all you're focused on is just losing weight, by all means, do cardio all day long. But that's not the goal whatsoever. There has to be that healthy blend of strength training and cardio. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. I think um, that's honestly, we've talked about this in previous episodes. That's sometimes I feel like the hardest part of our job is trying to convince people that strike training is more efficient for fat loss than mm -hmm. cardio. Like it's, it's not like you and I just really enjoy strength training and that's why we choose to do this with our clients. Like this is the proven, I always explain it like this. If you're doing cardio training, right? So if a client's on the elliptical, you're on that elliptical for 20 minutes. Say you burn 250 calories. That's awesome, right? But let's say you do a 30 minute session with you and you guys maybe do a leg day. You do a leg day, 30 minute session, burn 250 calories. Cool. Well, that leg day broke down a whole lot of muscle in your legs and your body is gonna be rebuilding and repairing all that work that you did for 48 hours. So you're continuing to burn calories that whole time. Right. I think that's what people don't understand is that it's, it's the most efficient route. It's the most practical way to go about it. Now, that's not saying you should just do strength training and forget about cardio. The best answer is mixing the both. But if you just focus heavily on cardio and dismiss strength training, I agree with you. That's not a good route. You'll probably lose a lot of muscle and then you'll probably even, it'll be harder to get your metabolism and your muscle back at that point too. I feel a, a, a tough thing that I see with clients is that when we do just strength training and not that many cardio bursts, like we just focus on specific compound movements is that by the end of the workout, their calorie burn is not a lot. And they're like, oh, like we barely burned 150, 200 calories. I'm like, I understand that. How Check, go back and look at the chart. How high did your heart rate go? Throughout the whole workout, it, there's probably going to be peaks and valleys, which is perfectly fine, but your heart rate wasn't going as high as it would as if you were doing steady state cardio or high intensity cardio. In doing that, if you want to tie your, like I said, tie yourself to a treadmill, Peloton, whatever, you're going to burn hundreds and hundreds of calories in a shorter period of time than you would with strength training. But like what you just said, you're going to burn more calories long term with strength training rather than cardio. Cardio, you're going to burn all the calories in the moment. Strength yeah. training is going to take more time. Yeah. So driving that point home to clients, I've I've had clients for years. And I'm still driving that that point home to. Like if they leave the session, they're like 150 calories. I'm like, I deal with that same thing. Yeah. I definitely do. And I feel like you'll even see clients put emphasis on cardio so much. Have you ever seen clients where like? They'll go to the gym and they'll start every gym lifting workout with a HIIT workout. Then they wonder why their strength training is ineffective and they're not making progress. It's because you're wasting all of your energy right. towards HIIT when you should be putting that towards strength training and you'll get more benefit. Right, exactly. You know? Yeah, I mean, having that, like we just said, the healthy blend. So it's like if you go to the gym and you're like, all right, I'm going to go run an all-out mile real quick on the treadmill and then go work out. It's like that, like you just said, you're, you're burning way too, way, too, way too much energy ahead of time your glucose is completely depleted and your muscles are not gonna have energy for an efficient 
strength training workout. Yes, you'll be able to lift, but you're not gonna be able to lift as heavy as you yep. want to because everything was just put out on that track. Yeah, I feel like it would honestly be better to just do like a proper warm up, put most of your energy towards strength training, and then finish with low intensity cardio where you'll still burn calories, but you could have put most of your high quality work towards strength training. Right, exactly. Now, Cool. Yeah, you gotta have that pri the priority of what what is this day focused on right yeah. now, not just like walk. And I feel like that's the downfall is that people can walk into the gym like, eh, I guess I'll start with this and then I'll do that. So there's no plan going into the yeah, gym. Yeah, definitely taking an approach. Right. Definitely, I definitely think it's safe to say that that one is a myth. Correct. All right. So this next one was actually a real conversation with one of my clients the other day. I thought this was a good question. Very valuable topic. His question was, when it comes to strength training, if I do things slower, is that better? Without a doubt. I mean, it's, you have to focus on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. If you were just going through your exercises, just trying to knock them out. And then, you know, if you have your whole template of like, okay, this is what we're doing today. And you try and boom, 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 and get it done as fast as you can. You're out the door early. That's not, you didn't do that properly because I guarantee you there is at some point you, you're, you weren't focusing on something. Every specific move that you do needs to be focused on. We've said this many a times, and we've said this in earlier episodes, how Arnold Schwarzenegger said that working out is therapy because you shouldn't have any other thought in your mind other than if you're doing a row, okay, you're pulling your elbow back, you're squeezing your shoulder blades together. If you're doing a squat, you're sitting your butt back like you're in a chair. Like you're focusing on that mind-body connection so much that there cannot be another thought trying to penetrate your mind. So being as specific as you can, slow, controlled, you know, focusing on tempo, focusing on time under tension, like yeah. different ways to manipulate the muscle, but at the same point in every avenue of that, you are focusing on slow controlled movements. Yeah, I love that. That reminds me of the mindfulness episode we did and we talked about just the importance of the now. And I think that's what you're saying when you're working out, if you're about to do goblet squats, but you're thinking about what you're doing at 4 p.m., you're not in the now. Right. The now is you're feeling that weight, you can feel exactly where it's working and you're controlling that weight throughout the whole time. Yeah. I will have clients who love to talk during the workouts. And it's great because that's a part of personal training. But if they're in the middle of an exercise and they're talking, 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 I'll, it, it's tough because I might come off as a bad guy. I'm, I'm either saying, hold the thought, let's focus for a second. Or sometimes I do it too. If they are about to start and I'll start a conversation, I'm like, oh, hold on, wait till you're done. And then that way they can just focus on what they're doing because I, you, you can't do two things at once. Absolutely. Yes, you can do the motion, but it's like, are you mo using your primary movers yeah. in, in that exercise? Yeah, are you feeling it where you're supposed to? Yeah, right. I, I love even the like the time under tension rule. I don't think that's all you should train every time you work out or anything like that, but it's a really good tool. And I, I think of a lot of people doing a dumbbell row. And have you ever seen people at the gym where they're doing a dumbbell row and they're putting their whole body into it swinging? Tell me if you disagree. I think there are people out there that are doing like sets of 10 on dumbbell rows that truly couldn't do two reps with that weight pausing and then having actual eccentric on the way down. So going off of what you were saying with controlling the weight, so it say someone's doing a 70 pound dumbbell row and they're throwing their whole body into it. If they drop that down to like say a 45, 50 pound dumbbell, egotistically, they're not going, going to want to do that because it's less than 70. No, I want to lift as heavy as possible. Okay, but going into time under tension, going into really controlling the weight, squeezing, controlling on the eccentric on the way down, you're probably going to feel that burn. And I'll say it again, feel that burn way more than you will with that 70. Yeah. Because I guarantee you people are probably lifting that 70. Oh, I got 10 reps out of it. Did you feel a burn? Where did you feel it? Like, are you feeling it in accessory muscles? Like, are you feeling it in secondary movers? No, or they probably are, yes. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. that's not the point. You wanna feel it exactly where you're trying to pinpoint, not like I'm moving the weight off the ground. Absolutely, I so agree with that. And I yeah. find, I think a common mistake too is people think like, the way you make progress is by going heavier. That's not always the case. I had a really good talk with my client Rich this morning. Uh, shout out Rich, I know he's a listener. Um, Rich, we were talking about how we were doing TRX split squats for a while. And then this week we got to a point where he was doing body weight split squats for a while. And same thing as far as RDLs and suitcase dumbbells go, he hit the hex bar deadlift. You can progress on movement. And I actually feel like that is more valuable sometimes than just going heavy. If you like outgrow a movement because you're controlling it so well, that's almost better than just going up a few pounds, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and this is kind of going off topic a little bit, but if you're able to 
change, have the same movement. So if you're doing a dumbbell row, but doing it a different way, yes. with, not just with a dumbbell, but doing it with like manipulating the muscle another way with the same movement. Yeah, like That's, if you're doing a, a bench supported row and you feel like you're crushing it with the 70, well then why don't you try not leaning into the bench, right. just use your core to stabilize right. you and do a single arm bed right. over row. So I love that, it's yeah, a great point. Absolutely. So I think, again, we can without a doubt say that that is a truth. Controlling the weight is going to be more beneficial in strength training. Yep, absolutely. Next topic. The absolute best way to build your core is by doing a lot of sit-ups and a lot of planks. Do you think that's a truth, myth, or somewhere in between? I think it's somewhere in between. Yes, doing planks will help your core. You have two types of ab, I mean, you have a ton of ab muscles, you have a ton of core muscles, but two specific ones, you have your transverse abdominis, which is your core, and you have your rectus abdominis, which is your abs, your visible abs that you can see. So if you're doing sit-ups, you're working your rectus, you're, you're, you're working your outer abs, you're not working your core. Like doing a bunch of crunches is not going to help your plank or whatever sort of movement that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, doing the transverse, working on the transverse abdominus, that's going to be way more beneficial because that's working on stability. So that's yeah. going to help you and uh, translate into so many different lifts. If you're doing 100 crunches a day, that's not going to help you with, you know, performing a squat properly, doing a bent over row, stabilizing your core, stabilizing your hips. So having a strong core is going to be way more beneficial. Yes, I totally agree with that. I feel like that's what you have to think is like, what is your core's function? And I feel like it's to, to, to serve stability, to stabilize you. And if your training doesn't reflect that and you're just trying to like initiate a burn, you're not understanding the whole point of that. Right. Um, I'm a huge advocate for anti-rotation movements where like even like a Paloff press where there's resistance just trying to pull them this way and they're just trying to brace and stay still and stabilize. Um, something I love about that is that there is resistance there. So I'm using, like I use the bands and I could use a 10 band, 20 band, whatever, but you can progress on that. That's something that I find really good about that is someone can outgrow that band. They can work on that band for a few weeks then we can add another element to it. Right. Um, even with planks, I love planks. I do them with clients all the time. But if a client's getting better at planks, I'm not gonna just have them do a five minute plank. Correct. We're gonna put some weight on their back. We're gonna add some shoulder taps. Like let's add, let's add to the movement. You manipulate it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And a, a lot of corrective moves can help with your core. So a lot of the warm ups I do with clients are corrective based. So when clients are doing it, they're like, why the hell am I doing this? This is so goofy, but at the same point, when you focus on what you're doing, so for instance, I got, a lot of times I'll have clients do a prone dead bug. So the a supine dead bug, you're lying on your back and your legs and your arms are moving. Prone dead bug, you're on your hands and knees um, and you tuck your toes in and you barely bring your knees off the ground. So your knees are elevated, you're on your hands and your toes. Almost like a bear crawl hold. Correct. And in doing that, that's, I think way tougher than doing an actual plank. Absolutely. Because you're one, you're working other muscle groups, but at the same time, the moment that your butt comes in the air, your abs are coming out of the equation. So in doing that, like I said, it looks goofy, but at the same point, do 20 seconds of it. Do 20 seconds of that and then do a 30 second plank. I guarantee you, you're gonna have an easier time with a 30 second plank, mainly because that's such an a universal core move, which, yep. like I said, not knocking it, it's a great move, and I will always use planks. Yeah. But you have to be able to, one, like we just said with you, uh, the planks, manipulate it and do other moves that are going to stabilize that transverse abdominus. Yeah, like even with strike training, like if you had a client that was doing dumbbell rows and they were using 30s one week, they wouldn't do 30s every single week. They would eventually do something to make it harder. And I feel like it's no difference with core. You just have to like like manipulate the movement, like you said, or, or change it up somehow. You have to make progress. It's not just like hold it longer. Or, like I love that if a plank's too easy, instead of just doing it longer, let's do a bear crawl hold. Let's kind of humble yourself. Right, exactly, awesome. exactly. So I think that's definitely safe to say that that is somewhere in between somewhere in between yeah there's definitely a lot of variables and it really just depends on what what each person needs to focus on individually yeah so next topic another really good one when it comes to protein after a workout you have to get your protein in within 30 minutes of your workout or it's wasted I feel like you should take the reins on this to start because from what we've talked about before, I, I really think you should start. Yeah, off absolutely. You know, I'm fired up about this one. Yeah. I love this one. This one I talk to clients about all the time. So I personally do not think that is true at all. I think that's a myth. I think that when it comes to protein uh, for a workout, it is vital that you get a pro that you are loading up your body with protein when it comes to strength training. That is essential. 
But I find that it, that you are consistently getting that in within two hours before or after your workout, hence the anabolic window. Mm -hmm. From my understanding, this whole 30 minute of you need to get your protein in was originated by protein shake companies. If you are a gym member and you live more than 20 minutes away, that was a really creative way for these protein companies to incentivize their members to purchase that convenience protein shake that happens to be right there. Right. When in reality, they do have more time to do that. Right. And I'm honestly so passionate about that, just like you and I were talking about, because I think that's a lot of things with health and fitness in this country where you almost see it at the service level and you trust it for what it is but you can't trust it for what it is. There's more to it and there's not really good intentions behind it. Right. Um, with strength training, nutrition, a lot of this stuff, you have to like take that extra step to look into these things. You really have to like do your research, take multiple angles, um, really like learn from multiple perspectives, you know? Right. Anything you have to say about that? If a client asks me, does it have to be 30 minutes? Do you have to have the protein within 30 minutes of the workout? And I guess, yes, you can argue and say the sooner the better, but at the same point, I could go back to them and say, well, why not an hour? You know, like what, what, who's saying that it just has to be 30 minutes. So if you do want it to be close to 30 minutes, you can bring a shake with you or ha have a smoothie ready for you in your, in your car, Pr uh, prepare a meal at home when, for that. When you finish your workout, you do get home. It's ready for you to have right there. Cause if anything, that's going to incentivize you to be ready throughout the day to have your protein, to have your meals, starting off with a prop and I'll, I'll also, I'm saying this as if someone's working out in the morning. This goes for if you're doing it midday, afternoon, whatever, but it's going to help jumpstart the rest of the day for you in having your nutrition in line. So if anything, having that readiness to have your protein, I guess within 30 minutes is good because of this, like I said, you're able to, I'll tell clients that if you have something at the ready after your workout, that way you're closer to that 30 minute mark, that's great. But if you are not having the protein within that 30 minute mark, it's fine if you're like, you don't have to be tied down to the 30 minutes after. If yep. it's a little bit after, if it's approaching an hour, two hours, it's not the end of the world. It's not like all of your gains were lost, yes. you know, from not getting that protein right at 30 minutes. Yep. It's just something to be aware of. Like I had my strength training workout. I should be having protein somewhat soon. Right. It's, it's not like you have to be rushing to the nearest shake bar and getting it within 30 minutes. Right. And once it hits 31 minutes, it's a waste. Right. Like, exactly. So right. definitely fair to say that's a myth. I would say so. <laughs> Next topic no pain no gain if clients or anyone is not sore or isn't feeling their workout the next day or two that means that they did not go hard enough and that was a waste of a session just because they're not sore doesn't mean that they didn't get a great workout in the day before so a lot of times what that means for me is okay what we were just saying earlier how can i manipulate stuff that we've done before to make them sore but at the same point they don't have to be dragging themselves out of the gym be like oh my god i can't even lift my legs anymore Absolutely. yes it's going to happen every once in a while but you shouldn't be doing that to the point where it's like i can't walk the next day 100 yeah. percent. i completely agree with that and i feel like you'll oftentimes with new clients especially like i feel like if you get someone who's not worked out at all and they come to you for the first time it's very fair they're probably going to be sore the first few sessions but I find like in my career, if I have a client I've been working with for six months and six months down the line, we're crushing workouts and they're not sore at all. That's honestly awesome. They're probably doing their mobility, their routine, um, their nutrition is on point. They're sleeping really well. Sometimes that's even a testimony to your recovery. You're doing the things that you're supposed to be doing. Right. You know? So when you're in the moment working out, if I'm, if I'm having a client do a specific move and they're feeling that burn within like as they're actively doing that exercise, that's good. Cause you want to like going back to what we said earlier, you're controlling the movement and you're really focusing on that specific area. That's where you should really be feeling the burn. Granted, you might not be insanely sore the next day or the day after, but at this, when you were in the moment, you were activating the specific muscles and you were targeting what you were looking for. Dude, I think that's such a good point. Like, I feel like if you had a client that was so adamant, like I'm not sore, Nick, I'm not sore. That would be my solution would be like, all right, Next time we're working out, let's make sure that in the moment you can feel the burn and you yeah. are feeling it. And I think that's more important than sore does. Absolutely. So that's awesome. Yeah. So concluding that, without a doubt, we will say that that is a myth, that no pain, no gain. If you are not sore after, that means the workout didn't work. Myth. Not true. Last topic. So let's say you have a client who has committed to the fitness journey. They want to lose weight. They've been strength training for a month or two, doing everything that they're supposed to, and they're losing no weight at all they must be doing everything wrong at that point and should take a different approach. Myth, 
somewhere in between or truth? It can definitely be a myth, but I'm going to go with the somewhere in between approach just because there's so many variables with this. Someone could be doing everything right. Their nutrition could be in line. They're sleeping properly. They're not stressed out. They're uh, killing their workouts. But at the same point, they could just need some time off. And I'll recommend it's the toughest decision I make sometimes, but I'll tell clients, like, listen, take a week, take two weeks, take some time off especially if they've been doing the same routine for a little bit, take some time, let your body rest, let it fully rest. And it's, like I said, it's very tough because I want people to do the most that they can, but I have clients that I've said, listen, let's, let's, let's give it a week, see how you feel, and let's pick back up the week after. Yeah, and you're not going to lose your progress in a week also. I promise you that, all clients. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's tough because like, if you've been busting your ass and you're like, why is nothing working? It's like, okay, let's, let's take a step back. Let's reevaluate. Let's see. Because yeah. there's no point in keep pushing forward if... If you, if you haven't been getting results, what can we adjust? Yeah. Where, where can we reevaluate? Absolutely. I, I, I agree with that. I think I've made a video about this before. I never suggest using weight as your primary progress indicator. Right. And I think sometimes, I actually used to see that in my old job all the time. Um, we had an in-body machine, the body scale. I remember all the time, this exact situation I described. I get a new client, we're two months in, they go in for their check-in. They'd hop on that scale first and, and they just see their weight, nothing else. And they look at me and I could see like the anger, like that's the same weight that I started at. But I'd just be like, just wait. And we'd get the printout and the printout would show us that they're down like 3% body fat, up three pounds of muscle, but the scale didn't move. That is so much better than losing weight yeah. is that you're losing fat and building muscle. But not a lot of people have access to those kinds of machines. So how many people out there are doing everything that they're supposed to be doing, only weighing themselves and quitting because they think it's wrong? Right, exactly. Is it easier when you wake up in the morning? Do you have more energy? Are your clothes fitting differently? Yes. Have you noticed a change in anything in your daily life in a positive way? Yeah. Are you getting up and down steps easier? Right. And I, I recently have had a client where they, something happened where uh, they were with friends and they were, they did like a, a run or something like that. They were climbing stairs. I forget exactly what it was, but they said they were like, I used to, like after we did that, I was not dripping sweat, but like out of breath and like, you know, wow, like that, that was like more of an eye opener and they recently did it and they're like, didn't feel that way. Like it was a positive. I'm like, that's huge. Cause that's one, improving your quality of life. And two, it's a non-scale victory. And I feel like those should be push so much more at yeah. non-scale victory because yes, we want to keep an eye on the scale, but at the same point, there's, a myriad of things that you can adjust and be better at that is off the scale and that's going to improve your activities of daily living. Yep. Oh, dude, I, I completely agree with that. I feel like you get a lot of clients where, I'm sure you have, everyone does, I think you get a lot of clients where they're preparing for a vacation because they want to look good, right? But some of my favorite client experiences are when maybe I'm working with someone elderly and they're working for a vacation not to look good, but to feel better. Then they go on that vacation and come back like, I was moving so well, I was able to act. Like, that's what it's all about. The right. scale couldn't have moved at all, but if they were thriving on that vacation, that's way better in yeah, my opinion. Absolutely. After having said all of that, like I said, there are a ton of variables, but it could be a myth, but at the same point, I feel like personally, for the most part, that's somewhere in between whether it's a myth or a truth. Yeah, I feel like in all reality, a lot of these things are somewhere in between. And right. that's, I hope that's a big takeaway from a lot of this stuff is not a lot of things are black and white. Not right. a lot of things is like, this just works and it doesn't. It's some, a lot of things work for some people, works for other people, and you gotta find what works best for you. Right. It's individualized for each person and you know, it can't just be, like you said, it's not black and white. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of like the goal of this is just to share like as many resources as we, as we can with people, share our experiences, and then hopefully people can learn and get something out of this absolutely you know yeah awesome sure. awesome awesome well thank you guys as always for joining us please stay tuned keep the comments coming below questions in person with the sessions we'll see you guys next time yep see you guys next time hey. peace